Hi. Um, before starting, who yeah, was on the, the morning session? Okay. Almost everyone. So, um, on my morning session, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, this was supposed to, to be a practical workshop, uh, but uh, uh, we didn't manage to, to get uh, tables and uh, uh, power source, and so uh, this is going to be uh, more on the theoretical part. Uh, I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to try to explain some uh, more advanced things, so uh, you might uh, uh, look at this presentation as an advanced uh, or a uh, um, a sequel of the, the first one that I gave. Uh, so, uh, let me know who here uh, knows a little bit about Docker, made some tutorials or something like that. And who here knows a lot about Docker? Okay, so, uh, this is me, don't care. Uh, I'm going to, to um, show some best practices uh, uh, about making uh, Docker images. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these things. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, to talk about some, some tips that are useful and uh, usually nobody knows unless uh, they, uh, they find the problem. So I'm going to start for uh, some Docker best, best practices uh, on uh, how to improve the Docker, uh, Docker files uh, in order to build better images. So remember that uh, a Docker file is just a file with a set of instructions uh, and it represents the, the blueprint of a Docker image. Um, and there are lots of things uh, we can improve. Uh, some of them are uh, image size. Uh, the incremental building time for developers, this is very important. Uh, the consistency and repeatability so that uh, everyone can run uh, and don't have the, the runs on my machine problem. Uh, maintainability and security. Uh, and this is what I'm going to, to, to look after today. So let's take an example. This would be a, a simple Java project. Who here knows uh, our programs in Java? Okay, most of you, that's nice. So you uh, may be familiar with the, the, some of these files, like the, the palm.xml, uh, the source uh, with the code, the target, and whatnot. Uh, and there's here a Docker file. So let's start uh, with the, some uh, Docker file that uh, uh, a newbie would write. So a Docker file represents the blueprint of an image. So we start always with a from statement. It's mandatory. Uh, and we will start uh, from the Debian uh, file system. Um, and we'll, we'll build our image on top of that. So uh, this I think this is very easy to interpret. So uh, we start by copying all the files in the current directory. So the, the, um, this, uh, these files. We copy everything. Uh, to the Docker image uh, on the um, uh, dash app uh, file system. Uh, and then we run uh, an apt get update to update the package repository. And then we, means we will install some dependencies we need to run this image, uh, mainly the Java development kit. And then we instruct uh, the, um, the container that when we when the container starts it will run this uh, this doesn't work it will run this uh, Java uh, jar file okay uh, so here we have some some commands for the docker file the from the copy the run and CMD CMD uh, is a special command so um, it doesn't run but the others the the copy will copy the files the run will run that uh, that uh, command uh, on the Linux um, inside the, the container. I think I will explain this uh, more uh, in front. Um, and yes, this is the, the uh, a basic um, Docker file. Uh, and Sorry, questions at the end? Or, or maybe during the, the, the interview, t the, the presentation is better. Let me just um, remember the, the image is a list of layers. 
each Docker command will build one layer that will be built on top of the previous one. So the from Debian, uh, it's an image. A layer, it's also an image. Uh, so the first one, uh, the layer is from the, the Docker Hub repository, the official Debian image. Then we will build another image just with the files uh, that we copy, and we apply it on top of the previous image. And then the app to get update, it's another layer that uh, stays on top of the previous one, and uh, so on. Uh, do I have a question? Yes. So um, uh. the, the Docker itself, uh, can we write to the, the var directory, or is it uh, if there is any risk of a power cycle of sorts that would erase that? So let so me writing to uh, the app directory. Uh, uh, yeah. So the the container has a file system. In this case, it's a, a file system similar to to the Debian uh, file system, and we can copy everything to every uh, file system we want. Uh, you just have to to be aware of the Debian file system in this case. So you can it's copy for whatever. Sorry. Hmm? I said var, but it was temporary. Uh, I mixed up. Uh, sorry, I, I did. said var, but it was it would be temporary, not var. Uh, okay, sorry. to to I the temp file. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it will uh, it would be maintained. I think it would depend on the 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 um, uh, the from the base image uh, because the the temporary file it's just a file. Uh, it has a special um, hook, uh, more or less like that. That when you reboot the machine, there's some hook that will erase the, the TMP folder. So uh, in, he, in this case, in the containers, it's just a regular folder like uh, any other one. So this app doesn't exist. When I do the copy, it will create the, the path. Um, so let's start by improving some basic things. Uh, who here knows this joke? Right. OK. Let's skip it. Uh, so. Uh, there is a very good feature about Docker and how he builds images and how he stores and how he caches uh, images and layers. So um, Docker will uh, use uh, the cache uh, when uh, it can. So if I have the Debian image on my local machine, it will use that. Uh, it is already cached. It will not uh, try to, to upgrade to see if there is a new image. It will just use what I have on my local machine. Each time it, uh, it builds, when I run a Docker build, it will, uh, it will see if I have that layer already cached in my system. If I don't have, it will run that line. If I do have, it will use the, 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 um, the cache. There are uh, three uh, cases where the, the the cache needs to be rebuilt. Uh, the first one is if I change the line on the Docker file. If I change it, of course, it will rebuild it because it's different from what I have in cache. Another way to to rebuild that layer is if um, if it is a copy. Uh, when any file regarding that copy is changed, it will rebuild that layer. So. Here I have the, the copy of the, my whole um, file system, my, my local uh, workspace. And if I change any file there, the copy will run again. The other case for a cache to be rebuilt is if the previous cache has been rebuilt. So this means that uh, when I have this, um, this line here, the original, every time uh, I'm developing and I change some kind of file, if I do a uh, build, uh, if I rebuild the, the Docker image, it will rebuild every single, uh, every single uh, layer here and there. So changing one file will trigger uh, an app to get update and app to get install. I have to install everything again. To change that, I move the, the copy to, to here, and when I change just one file, uh, as this didn't change at all, it will just rebuild this layer, and the, the previous ones are already uh, stored, are, are already cached. So the building time is improved a lot. And I think, yeah. Another thing that we can do is just copy what we need. So. Uh, 
here we were running just the jar. We don't need the source files. We don't need everything else. We just need to copy what we need. This will improve the image, the final image, uh, regarding the size. Uh, so um, another thing we must uh, keep our attention is uh, about the cache, because there are parts where we want the, the Docker build to cache, but there are some others we don't. So in this case, if we run this in separate uh, lines, what happens if there is some, uh, let's say that uh, we found out that an, uh, the SSH package, for example, has a security issue. We would like to update it to the, the, last, to the last version or to a specific version uh, like this. If you want to do uh, something like this to, to to specify a, a, a tag, um, a package version to a newer end. When, when we do this change, what do you think it will happen? So remember, the cache is rebuilt when the line changes. Uh, so this line changed, so the, the cache, the, this layer will be rebuilt. But since this layer hasn't changed anything, it wouldn't be rebuilt. So I changed this in order to, to update to the last version, but since this will never run, it will never have the, the, the last uh, version available. So in some cases, uh, I don't need to, to cache uh, in different layers. I want to run uh, apt-get uh, update and apt-get install. I want to run, an, run them on the same layer. I want to be, uh, they want to be, I want them to be coupled. So, in order to do that, I, uh, we can append the multiple commands uh, like we would do on a, a bash shell. And then um, this will run, uh, uh, and this will run on the same uh, layer, on the same command. So every time I change something on this line, uh, it will run the, the app to get update. It would be uh, a little. Uh, it would take a little more time, but we, it would be consistent. So we will always prefer consistency over time and over size. It's more important to have it consistently build, consistently building over time. Another pro tip that I usually give: it's uh, keep this uh, structured uh, in the um, meaning keep commands uh, on different lines so it, you don't have a one-liner, a giant one-liner that will be confusing to, uh, non, uh, to someone who doesn't build this. And uh, another pro tip, keep the, on the app to get installed mainly, keep the packages on, every, uh, on a single line and uh, uh, alphabetically ordered because it's, it will be easy to maintain on Git, for example. Next thing, don't uh, pack unnecessary dependencies. Mainly on containers, we don't need, on Docker containers, we don't need SSH or some uh, Vim or something like that. Um, unless you are specifically uh, doing some specific things, we don't need this. If we really need to, to enter on a running container, on development, you can use the docker exec command that will do just that. So you don't need to, to pack this. Um, another thing that uh, it's good if you remove these unnecessary dependencies is about security. You have less packages, you have, uh, have lots of um, less software, you have l less uh, uh, attack vectors. Uh, another thing, uh, respect to, to the app to get installed, it's uh, this flag, uh, so it doesn't install uh, unnecessary dependencies again. And uh, another thing is that uh, the, the way Docker builds an image, it's a layer on top of the previous layer. A and as the layers are immutable images, if you remove some file on a, on a command, you uh, would remove it for, from the, the, um, the file system in the meaning that when you start the container, you would not, uh, you would not access that file. But since the images are immutable, 
once you build uh, a layer and you uh, have a file in that layer, even if you remove it on next layers, that file will be present on the Docker image itself. So, uh, for example, if I copy a file with one gigabyte on one command and then remove it on another command, that uh, Docker image will still have that one gigabyte file. Uh, so the, the size will still have that. Um, in order to, to try to not include some files uh, on the final do Docker image, you can remove the files on the same command. So uh, if you remove the files before the command uh, finishes, that file will not be stored. If you remove it only after, then uh, it will be stored. Uh, there's also a feature that I'm not going to, to, to specify here and not going to talk about it, that can, uh, um, I'm not, I don't remember the, the name of the, the command, but it can um, like compare, um, uh, it can just uh, take the, the final image and remove unnecessary files that are inside. There's a command to do that. I personally don't like it because I it's more obscure the way you do it, but uh, you can remove files from images like that. Um, but uh, you will have to search it. I don't remember the name of the command, sorry. Uh, then we can do a thing a lot better. Let's remove everything we, we did until now. And let's just use uh, an official image that will be better suited for wha what we are doing. If you want to, to build a, a Java project, you have the OpenJDK image, and you can use it. It's already installed. The, you don't have to install it manually, so it will take uh, uh, it will reduce a lot the time spent on building it. it. Uh, and more, uh, you have. You have uh, images with, with less size, usually. Uh, and uh, it's uh, well done for containers. Uh, the, the best examples for this kind of usage are the, the database, uh, database images, because they are already uh, set up for a bootstrap. They will create the database and user and whatnot. And if you install it from, from scratch, from the, the package, manager, you will have to do it yourself. So usually it's easier, it's um, faster, and uh, this is usually built by smarter peop and, uh, people than myself, so uh, usually it's better to use it. And uh, as a bonus, uh, I don't, uh, I wouldn't rely too much on that, but Docker says that uh, every image on the Docker Hub is scanned for uh, vulnerabilities, so it's uh, it's a good thing. Uh, do you have any questions until now? So every time I have a from something, that will be the the image name. The um, then. Uh, my Docker server on my machine will do the following. It will see, firstly, if I have that image already in my system. If that image is already cached, it will use that image. If it's not, it will search on the official repository Docker Hub. Uh, so um, there are other repositories. If you want to use another repository, you, the, the, um, you can use a full where, uh, URL on the, the from, uh, but uh, yeah, it's more advanced uh, or it's a different uh, usage. Uh, but I want to use a basic OpenGDK uh, add some layers and then the use that as a, as a new... So the OpenJDK, it's an image, it's a Docker image itself. You can see how, it's, uh, how it is built. Uh, it has a Docker file, it's uh, open source, I believe. Uh, so you, you can build it yourself. Um, and so the, the, there are lots of base image. There's, uh, for example, there is the, the scratch image that doesn't have any file system. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to, to use that one because you can't even run uh, commands easily and you don't have users and whatnot. Um, but there are uh, lots of images. I don't remember f uh, 
the the base image for the Open GDK. I, I, I don't remember if it's Ubuntu or Debian, but it's probably one of those. Uh, the most used ones are, I think, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, um, Alpine, and uh, there's one that's also very tiny that I don't remember the name. Uh, but yeah, there are lots of base images you can have, and uh, you can use every any image as a base image. The, the base image is just the, the bootstrap, the, the file system that you will uh, build on top of. OK? The, did that answer? Yeah. OK. Nice. Can I have uh, a local repository on my company yeah. reference that and had that have that being updated continuously, continuously over by the, the central repository? Or would I have to, to do some sort of, uh, and is, is it open source? this controller, would I have to, to update it manually or is that uh, some way to so keep it updated? You can build uh, yourself, a, you can host yourself a, a, a Docker repository. There are specific Docker ones and there are other kinds of repository uh, like JFrog, I think, that will support Docker images. So you can just uh, have an artifact uh, repository to, to store Docker images. Uh, I uh, I th if I understood you correctly, you would like to do like uh, a caching uh, repository. Yeah, so like caching, uh, really probably there are solutions. I don't know that, uh, but there are solutions for aptigets uh, packages, and I'm sure the same solution would be able to to cache the Docker images. Uh, but yes, the, there is a, a common use of local repository. If you have some code you don't want open source for some reason uh, you and you still want to use docker of course you will host your your own uh, docker registry and and yes you use that um, nice Yes, that's the, the, the feature, the main feature of containers are exactly that. There is the Docker host that has a kernel and every Docker container, every container in general will run on top of that. That's why you cannot have uh, different architectures running on the same host. You cannot have a Windows container, for example, running on a Linux host. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's... So what is that's the best approach for if you want to upgrade? If you want to? to, you want to upgrade the, the like you do on an, any other application, you have to... You have to upgrade the host. And uh, yeah, the, the, then it will run directly on the host if you... You mentioned the areas that they are containers, so you can move them to another machine to play with your host. And you have to okay. do that. Or yeah. you use another service like Kubernetes. Kubernetes does that uh, yeah. automatically. <laughs> so let's continue. Uh, so reuse official images as much as possible. Another thing that it's a good practice for every software, um, specific, uh, use specific tags. By default, if you don't specify any tag, um, the Docker will use the latest tag. Um, uh, using the latest is, is an anti-pattern as, as other software. So uh, the latest is just a tag. It is not guaranteed to be the available. It's not guaranteed to, to exist. Uh, it's not guaranteed to, to be the, the latest, really. And uh, it skips major versions. So uh, try to, to use the, the, the versions available. The, the tags available, you can check the, the image documentation on Docker Hub. It usually says what versions are available, what tags are available. Uh, and yeah, the, you can use um, the, the version here. You should use. There's also other tags available. If you check the documentation, there are lots of ones. In this case, we don't need the development kit. We just need the runtime environment. We would 
we will not compile the, the jar. So uh, use specific tags uh, uh, as much as possible, um, as much specific as possible. There are also other flavors. Uh, usually there is a slim version uh, that the don't have the documentation and some uh, unnecessary things for containers and usually are much smaller. And for the courages, uh, there is also, usually there is an Alpine version. Uh, for those who don't know who Alp what Alpine is, uh, is a Linux distribution that it's uh, less than five megabytes on size. So it's really minimal um, Linux distribution. Uh, I have just to, to give you a disclaimer that uh, it, uh, there are some uh, use cases that Alpine doesn't work very well. So uh, most, uh, most of projects and most applications will do just fine with Alpine, but there are some cases that does not. So check accordingly to with your project. And by using s uh, specific tags, you usually get uh, a lot of gain in terms of size. Size is very important, not just about the, the storage that it needs, and this is the that is the, the, the minor part of it, uh, but it will be a lot faster to download, to build, to upgrade machines, to the, the um, workflow of the application, the DevOps, the DevOps workflow will be much uh, uh, much faster and uh, uh, and better if we use smaller images. Then, how can we find and how can we improve layers? How can we find what is uh, taking so much space, uh, so much storage in our in our uh, image? So there is the Docker image history that tells uh, layer by layer how much space, what is its size. So here in this example, um, or the first example, we would have here the, the, um, the install that takes uh, almost 700 megabytes and have each layer uh, and its size. So if we use this to, to understand um, where, is, where can we reduce the, the size, um, it's better. Uh, and uh, yes, this yes, this is another example. Another way to to because the Docker history just shows the the size by by layer. If you really want to 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 see what files are inside it, you may use this uh, this extra and uh, more exotic way to do it. Uh, Docker build, when it builds an image, it will create temporary containers. So it will start the, the, um, the image, the from image. It will create a container from that image. It will run that, uh, that run command. We will run on, a c on that temporary container. And when the run finishes, uh, it will uh, store that, that container. It will uh, store it in a, a layer. And then the next command will start on that, uh, that previous image, and so on and so forth. So um, there are lots of temporary containers created during the Docker build. If you use uh, that, uh, that um, uh, argument, uh, the, um, the rm uh, equals false, you will tell Docker to don't stop the don't stop and don't remove the containers after creating them. So after building this, uh, this has four steps. Um, you will have um, several uh, containers running uh, each step. So if you want to to go to uh, let's say the the second layer has uh, a lot of space, uh, has a lot of size, uh, and I don't know what files it has inside. You can use this and then enter on the, the, the container um, for that stage and uh, check and uh, see the, the file system and check what is there. Um, yeah, and uh, there's also the Docker container diff that uh, does uh, exactly that and uh, tells what are the files 
that were modified uh, on that container relatively to related to relative to the previous uh, image and that's it so let's make a checkpoint the difference in size from the the first example uh, to the the last example was uh, around 700 megabytes it has it uh, it is a lot of difference uh, and um, we started with this and finished with this so with some tweaks we got a, a much simpler image and uh, uh, a lot better so I w I'm really an advocate of using docker as documentation so we need to uh, and look for repers, uh, reproducibility and here we have some file that uh, appears by magic. Uh, usually there's uh, only a, a, a developer guru that knows how to build that image. Nobody else knows how to do that and it will, he will always be a part of the company because no one else knows how to do that. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know someone like that. And we can use Docker also to build that jar file uh, so it doesn't appear by magic. So let's undo everything we did until now and let's use the, the another image more appropriate for this. So Maven is the um, is the builder used within, within this application. We can start uh, from the, the Maven image in order to build our, uh, our application. We can uh, copy the, the files we need. We can run that Maven package uh, that will build the jar file. And uh, here with this, we have, uh, we have this, this file, um, but it didn't appear by magic, so it compiled the, the, the code during the Docker build. Uh, we can uh, improve some things here. Uh, we can use the work there that says uh, from now on uh, it's my, my working directory inside the container is th this one. Uh, we can also force some dependencies to be cached. Uh, if we run the the um, the Maven, okay. If we run this, only this, it will download every dependency. But usually, when I'm programming, I don't uh, add dependencies all the time. So I want, I still want that uh, if I change one file, it doesn't have to download everything again. So if I run this uh, dependency downloader, uh, if I download the dependencies on a separate uh, on a separate command. It will cache those dependencies, uh, and then if I change uh, some source file here, uh, it just rebuilds this and rebuilds the, the, um, the jar file without having to download 700 megabytes of dependencies. Um, the but now we have a little more complicated Docker file, and we have the same problem that I stated before. We have still unnecessary dependencies on our final image. So if I just want to run a jar file, I don't need all the Maven stack installed on this container. So how do we fix this? We can use multi-stage builds. And you can identify multi-stage by this uh, from uh, images. So we have two froms here, meaning that we have two stages. And what Docker build does, it will start by building the last one, the last from. So it will start by building this. And uh, if you check here, we have uh, this from, this new from builder. That means that instead of copying this from my local uh, file system, I will copy that file from the builder image. That is another image. Uh, and we'll copy that uh, instead. Uh, and since when Docker build is running this one, uh, identifies that this is another stage and uh, it will find what stage it is and rebuild and uh, build also this uh, temporary image, this stage. 
So with this, uh, you can you can see that the the last part uh, is the same from our checkpoint. The only difference is this builder, uh, and here it will build the final image will just be this last part. So uh, in terms of the comparison between these two, it will be the same in terms of size, in terms of what is in the image. But our Docker file is documenting how to build that that file. Uh, and so uh, it's much better to than a file that mysteriously appeared. Multi-stage builds are used for other things, like, like uh, building different environments, uh, slight variations uh, of images. Uh, they are also used as functions in code, so d you don't have to repeat the same steps. And, um, uh, and uh, speci platform specifics, so you can have um, if you use Go, for example, Golang, you have an image that compiles, uh, uh, that cross compiles for one architecture, and another image that cross compiles for another architecture, and whatnot. Uh, but I'm not going to cover this, uh, mainly because I don't know every use case. Uh, good question. Yeah. Do we have a limit on, on number of stages nope. that we can have? So I can like. You can do whatever you want. There. Probably uh, <laughs> you will not want to build thousands. I, th I believe the, the Mobi project, the, the Docker uh, core project, have like uh, 50, 50 stages, I, I believe. So uh, you probably will not want to, to have uh, thousands <laughs> of layers. Um, but yes. Uh, so. About security, there's, there's a, a good practice that you should always uh, look for. That uh, is running Docker as non-root. By default, Docker containers run as root. Uh, and although they are uh, contained and cannot access the, the system, the, the host uh, file system, and cannot do any root on the host, uh, it's not uh, that good practice to, to be running an application as root. Uh, and uh, if you find some zero-day exploit on Docker itself, it would be uh, it would be better not to have root running our our application. So, in order to to have another use it, uh, user, you have to install it, depending on the the, the base image you, you are using, and uh, and it would use it uh, like like this, and then it you would have to manually give permissions to that uh, to to the files to the file system and to the files you 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 would want your user to access uh, and uh, this instruction is what sets that from on now on every command everything will run as uh, my user that I just created before and <laughs> In this case, you wouldn't need this this uh, changing on the the ownership of the file because you are just running. But this is for uh, academic purposes. Um, everything would be fine, but uh, there's one thing here. If you do that Docker image history, you will see that the um, that layer, the the changing ownership, is uh, has the same size that copying the the file on the previous layer. Why this happens? Um, so Docker uses the the copy and write feature. That means that uh, every ev when you need a file, you will just read it from the same uh, s uh, the same place with the same file system, the same physical file system. But every time you change something on a file, you will copy the file uh, with that changes. So changing the ownership of the file is a change on the file, so it will copy uh, the, the entire file and change uh, his ownership. So if you copy uh, one gigabyte file and then on the next uh, command you change its ownership, the final size will be two gigabytes, and that's not desirable. So you have this, uh, this other uh, flag that you can use, that, uh, that you can use on the same copy command and it will fix that issue um, and yeah it's 
it spares uh, two megabytes here. And if you render the um, if you in run the container, if you create a container and run a who I am, it will have the that my user and uh, the permissions that I set uh, are here. So it would be like uh, completely separated uh, server, uh, as the the Pedro Magalhães showed on the, the the previous talk. If you saw it, uh, it was uh, it had some examples like this. So, until here, anyone has any question regarding this? So, let's review some uh, features for developers, mainly volumes. Uh, as I already stated be before, if you, whatever, if you, every time you want to see the changes you applied on your code, if every time you have to build it, uh, build uh, the image and copy all the files inside it, uh, it will take some uh, undesirable uh, extra time and you can do it uh, using, you can override that using volumes. So, in case of uh, developing, if you are using Docker Compose, um, you can use volumes and mount your local files, your, s your source files and whatnot, you can mount them inside a running container. So the, the container, when it's running, um, it will access your files directly. Uh, and so if you change some file in your uh, laptop, it will automatically uh, update the, the... It will be the same file that container is using. But if you use um, if you use that and uh, let's say you the container creates some files that files will be owned by the user inside the container so if the container is running as root the files created by that on my local machine will be owned by root if it's uh, if the the uh, container is running by uh, um, as a, a new um, as a new user that I created, it will have that uh, UID and the group, um, uh, unique UID and group UID. So, uh, that's what I just, uh, if you have, if you are very lucky, uh, the user inside the, the container will have the, the same UID and uh, it will match yours and then everything will uh, be okay. But usually uh, it's different. So there are some solutions for this. Uh, some of these are the main, uh, are mainly used because they are easier. Run everything as root is the easiest one of because it's, it's a default one. Uh, changing permissions so that everyone can write and read and delete files. It's also very easy to do. And you can create an image that has a fixed UID to match your developer's UID, but it's uh, really messy to, to do this with a, a team. Uh, if it's just you, it's very easy to do, but th if there are very many people and they have different UIDs, it will get messy. You can adjust uh, and, um, and you can uh, uh, change the, the container's UID um, f that the, the container brands. There's also another solution that may be uh, not for everyone. Who here does shell scripts? Okay, nice, most of you. So you like this one. You could use uh, an entry point script that would fix the, um, that would fix the permissions uh, within the container. So this would be part of a, a fix permission script. What it would do, the, the selected parts, it would uh, test the, the, um, the containers, uh, the UID container and the, the UID uh, that uh, I'm running as host, it will uh, change um, and it will change, uh, it will find um, all files owned by the, the original uh, container UID and change it to, to, to match the, the host UID. And so 
every time the the container would 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 start uh, it will run this uh, this script before doing everything else and would set the permissions so the 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 container would run and would have the files uh, with the with the same permissions uh, with the same ownership that my user outside it has um, and so this would be the the, the entry pipe entry point that would um, that would change the, the permissions, then um, this would be used uh, like this. In dev mode, you would set uh, the user to run with root, but the entry point, the, the first thing it would do, um, it was, um, it would change the permissions. You need root to change ownership, so uh, it would change the permissions with root, but then it would uh, exec uh, uh, it would go through with the the other application uh, user, and so uh, although you start the container with root, it, the application would not be run uh, as root, and so uh, we still have that uh, security that uh, is running without root my application. Uh, and this has uh, some advantages, like these ones. Uh, every Every developer can use the same image, and uh, the apps will run with the same user, and uh, changes uh, if I add one file or remove it or what, uh, whatever, that file I created will be owned by my, uh, my user outside the container. So this would be uh, the right thing to do. Uh, it's a little more difficult, but yes. So what about debugging with Docker? Uh, of course, when I'm developing, I want the debugger to be to be usable. So, how do I do that? Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not uh, that easy. It's not just plug and play. the The best option is using the. Um, so, in order to 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 debug uh, with Docker, you have to understand really understand how the debugger works in that framework or in that language. If you use uh, Java, for example, you would debug a Java application uh, like you, you would debug a remote uh, Java application. So you would expose ports and, uh, and whatnot. And um, yeah, the easiest uh, way to do it, it's like uh, configuring a remote deb debugging session. Uh, I, I was intending to, to to demo that here, but my my application that I usually use it's really broken on the debugger part, and I don't debug it for some months, so I don't remember how to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I I'll keep this anyway. More things. So there's usually uh, some complaints about. My storage, uh, I, I'm running out of storage because Docker is consuming a lot of space. And uh, there's a simple solution for that, that it's pruning, uh, the Docker system prune. This uh, will, will remove um, stopped containers that were not removed and, um, and uh, will remove unused images. So it's a very easy way to, to free up some space on my host. It will not uh, remove by default stop um, to not, not remove some things um, like uh, volumes and uh, some other things. Um, yeah, running containers, it, it does not remove. It does not remove some tag images and it not doesn't remove volumes. Uh, but if you use some other flags, um, yeah, just be careful with this because uh, it's really easy to have a container stopped that was not supposed to be stopped and we didn't want them it to be stopped, but it was stopped and uh, this will remove that container, that image and whatnot. And so you'll have to, to bootstrap everything again. Um, and there's another uh, uh, way to, to do this. So what's here? I'm starting a, a, a command uh, container with this run container. 
um, to, to get restarted if it goes wrong. And here I'm doing something very useful. I'm exposing here, I'm exposing the, the Docker socket, the, the Docker server socket. So how does this work? When I'm running the Docker client, the every Docker um, command in the command line, uh, it is the, the client that will communicate with the Docker server. In order to communicate with the Docker server, it will use uh, a socket, um, a Linux socket, and it will communicate uh, using that. If I map the, if I expose the, the Docker socket to a container, then that container w uh, will have the, the, um, the power to control our host, the Docker server, okay? If I expose like this, I can then run Docker inside the Docker container, and I can, uh, I can do uh, a Docker system prune, and as the container, uh, the doc and as the socket is exposed to inside the container, this Docker prune will affect my Docker on host. So, this is a, a dangerous thing. So you have to be careful uh, to what containers you do expose the, the Docker socket. Um, and this example specifically, it's, it's called YOLO because of that. Uh, so it will, uh, each hour it will do a sys uh, Docker system prune. I wouldn't recommend doing this, but if you <laughs> really want to save some space and you don't care at all uh, to, to save containers and images, you can do the just uh, this. Uh, and yeah. Any questions? Another way to save up some storage and uh, a best practice, is, um, a good practice in general, is uh, being careful with logs. Uh, by default, logs are not limited, so uh, an application can log for whatever it wants. Um, so it is a good practice to limit um, the, the size of the, the logging for that container. Uh, if you use a, a Docker Compose, you can use these logging options uh, and set it uh, like a max file and the max file size. My, my, my say yes. Um, and yes, if you have a lot of uh, services and a lot of containers, uh, this would not be very practical. So one thing you can do is just add uh, this to the default configuration. That uh, Etsy Docker daemon dot JSON uh, is the the configurations, uh, the optional configurations for for a, a Docker server. Uh, the file may not exist. If it doesn't exist, you can create it. It will read from there, uh, and you can you can add some uh, some additional configurations like this uh, this one for the the logging size. And then you restart your Docker, Docker uh, server, and uh, it will uh, start every container that it starts after this. It will be, it will have those options. It will not affect running containers, by the way. Another thing is network debugging. This is uh, much more complex doing this on a container than it is on my Docker machine. How would you debug the, the, the communications and the networking with a, a, a running application in my, uh, my computer? Probably I would do some TCP, uh, TCP dump or s and, and use some Wireshark or something like that. But since containers are on a separate interface, Usually, that's not uh, very easy to do. So you could uh, debug networks from outside, but you don't see inside the container's namespace, as I said. And you could debug inside the containers, but you e would need to install every tools so that containers would have them to, to debug the network. Um, also, there, there are some networks uh, flavors uh, in Docker. There is the, the bridge and the, that can access uh, the, the outside world. There's uh, the overlay um, that uh, allow 
the, the containers to communicate. There's also uh, the, the host uh, network that uh, if you specify that the container runs on the host network, the container will, will run on the, the same network that the, than the host. Uh, so it could access my local services uh, and uh, I would access uh, the, the container services directly without exposing any ports. That's not a very good practice. Uh, for example, if you run Nginx with the, the, with the, the, um, the host network, it would expose the 80 port. And if you have uh, already something running on the 80 port, it would fail because you cannot have multiple applications on the same uh, port. And um, uh, yeah, you can also configure containers um, to access that. Uh, one solution uh, is this uh, container uh, type of network. Uh, so uh, if I run this Nginx, how would I uh, TCP dump or something inside that container? I could run a separate container, I could run a, a, side, a, a sidecar container or like a sidecar container that would be on the <coughs> network of the same container that my web uh, container is running. So this is attaching a container to the same network and then I can use TCP dump or I can use SS and uh, uh, I would be inspecting this, the, the same network um, that, the from that Nginx container. Um, any question regarding this? So. Another feature that I want to talk about, another tip, is the Docker build kit. So, Docker build kit, it's, uh, it's a, a new thing. It was uh, present on the, the, um, the Enterprise Edition for Docker, but it was released uh, on this 18.89 uh, version and it uh, it is um it is an improvement over the the docker build engine so it's a little faster some ways but the, the most important things are the feature that it allows it allows some some uh uh, uh i some other options that I'm going to show on the next slide, um, but yeah, there there are some features that are available on Docker on Docker build kit. Uh, in and um, yeah, in order to use build kit, uh, you need to 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 change the the, the parser. I'm I I'll show how to do that, and you'll have uh, this feature. Uh, you'll have bind mounts uh, during the Docker build. Uh, this is a, a very nice feature um, and you can do cache mounts, uh, to temp file system mounts um, and uh, very useful. You can use secrets on the building time that will not be saved uh, on the image. Uh, you have to you remember that if I copy some file to that image, uh, like uh, for example, if I need to, to mm, download something from, from a repository and it needs my private key, I could copy the, that private key to inside the Docker image and I could use it and then remove it. But as you can remember, if I remove a file, uh, if once I copy a file to, to that image, it will be stored in the image forever. So uh, uh, removing it wouldn't solve my problem. So Docker build kit addresses this and also has an SSH agent, so you can, uh, you can clone private repositories with uh, an external private key and whatnot. So uh, this has lots of features and um, it is not limited to this because that, uh, that front-end parser, uh, you specify it with this. This is not a comment, this is uh, an instruction for running a different parser. So, uh, and you can build yourself this thing. Uh, I'm not telling you how to do that because I myself d don't know, but uh, yeah, I didn't even try to search it, but you can, do, um, you can do a parser to do other things. So in this example, this is a very useful uh, feature. Uh, this mounting cache is similar to, to a, a bind mount, so I would mount my, my local 
um, my local f uh, f um, it would bound I to bind this path inside the, the container to an outside uh, path uh, on my host. So why this is useful uh, for running uh, builders, uh, package builders that uh, need to download dependencies. Um, for example, Maven would need to download dependencies. What happens? Uh, during the normal, uh, during the, the regular Docker build, is that if I add a new dependency, it will invalidate that layer's cache and it will have to download every dependency again. If I use this new feature, the, the mount cache, uh, that folder, that file system will be stored on my local host. It will be kept do, uh, during multiple Docker builds. And when I rebuild uh, that layer, if I have to rebuild it, that uh, file system will not be invalidated. The cache will be, but not the file system. So it will build on top of the, the same file system. So the dependencies that I have, I have already downloaded will stay there. And if I add uh, just one extra dependency, it will download just that, that extra dependency and thus improving the, the, <coughs> the building time a lot. This is a very useful tool that uh, usually all developers want because they don't want to wait uh, for five minutes uh, to build the, 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 um, the Docker image and with good reasons to do that. BuildKit is not enabled by default. You can enable it uh, with the Docker BuildKit environment variable, and uh, it will be already um, on. Or you could change that uh, daemon.json and add the BuildKit features there. Questions? So, what next? We, we can use Docker to ensure uh, DevOps best practices in general. So use the, the Docker file and Docker Compose as documentation and maintainability. Uh, as I said, try to use version and tags. Uh, you should uh, think of a, uh, an application stack built with Docker. You should think it for production, uh, for yes, for running in production. So keep the, the the stack and Docker files and uh, whatnot production ready. Doesn't mean we'll deploy it on production, but keep them production ready at least. Uh, so keep it safe, use secrets. There is a feature uh, for Docker that is secrets that I'm not going to cover here. Uh, it depends on what you are using to, to, to work a straight Docker. So uh, I will not mention that. And um, yeah, try not relay, relying on uh, exec in into containers. Try to ensure DevOps best practices regarding monitoring, observability, and whatnot, so that you would never have to enter a container, see the log files, and whatnot. Uh, so it is uh, a little more difficult to see log files uh, if you have containers. So uh, use that as an advantage and configure the, the observability stack from scratch, from, from the beginning. Um, development ready, I don't remember. Ah, so keep the, the, the images in Docker Compose development ready. Uh, every person that configures Docker and Docker files and uh, uh, Docker Compose should have in mind that this is mainly for people. So uh, uh, make it easier for developers to adopt it, make it uh, uh, f uh, developer friendly, make it uh, easy to debug on that application, make it easy to just change a file and see uh, the, the result. So uh, have that in mind when creating the Docker stack. Um, have it ready for deploying in multi multiple environments. I didn't cover uh, that here, but uh, um, the, the best practices for configuring a Docker uh, image, one of the best practices 
Docker containers are using environment variables. So my, uh, I would create a uh, container with some environment variables that would uh, map to, to different uh, than default configurations. So when I'm building the application, I would make my app ready to read configurations for from the environment variables. Um, keep smart defaults, make it easy to start a container with minimal configuration, with minimal additional configurations, and um, try to think at high availability by design, not high uptime. I don't want a container to be running by uh, for two years uh, without killing it. I want to be running a container maybe for uh, uh, weeks, days, hours, minutes. Uh, I want it. I want containers to be ephemeral by design. So, uh, build your application thinking about that. Um, do health checks that I didn't cover because it also depends uh, uh, on what you use to orchestrate uh, orchestrate containers. But have in mind that healthy checks uh, make the app concurrency ready. Uh, the, uh, Docker is great for microservices and uh, thinking on the, the application concurrent ready. It's uh, a big advantage uh, for uh, for using Docker. Um, and uh, yeah, I try to ensure support for monitoring, observability, and whatnot. So if you want to know more, try to search for Docker captains. Docker captains are uh, community um, people that uh, did a great job on, uh, on helping the community on Docker. And uh, there, are, there are some references that I used during this presentation. You may check them. Um, also, you can join the Slack uh, channel for Docker community. It's an open community, and usually people help you a lot if you have any question. Uh, there's, oh, I think, around uh, a thousand people there or something like that. I don't remember. But yeah, there are a lot of people. And uh, usually these captains are, are very, very available to, to help you. And that's all. Uh, you can check my presentation here. It will probably also be part of the, the, the conference presentations uh, folder that doesn't exist yet, but uh, this is on, on GitHub and you can check there um, if you use it. If you are building uh, uh, your application uh, Docker support, uh, you can use this documentation as, uh, as documentation and uh, you can see the, some of the best practices here or search for the best practices from uh, this guy. It usually goes to the DockerCon event and uh, usually it does uh, uh, work better than I do explaining it. So. That's all. Thank you for being here. <laughs>